IVF is not about babies. IVF is about on-demand designer babies shipped worldwide. What is the rule for children's rights? There is one rule. The rule is adults do hard things for kids. If you are forcing a child to sacrifice for you, you are violating the rights of the child and that is where every adult should stand in the way. One of the most painful things in a child's life is if they've lost their mom or dad. Surrogacy splices what should be one woman, a mother, into three purchasable and optional women. So excited today to have on Katie Faust on the podcast, who is the founder of the organization Them Before Us and the author of the book Them Before Us and has done some amazingly important work on children's rights, which don't get talked about enough. And we're going to deep dive this. We're going to go through some controversial topics, obviously the fight for life abortion where adults' desires and needs are usually put before children and killing them. But then also when it comes to IVF and surrogacy, reproductive technologies, and even what is the ethical approach to adoption. So, so excited to have you on, Katie. Thanks for joining the podcast. It is my pleasure. It's my joy. Um, it's very nice to have, have a chance to have a conversation with you with a few friends. So Katie, tell me a little bit more about your background and about them before us. Um, Katie Faust background. I um, I used to work at the largest Chinese adoption agency in the world after my husband and I got married. Um, so I, I've had a heart for kids for a long, long time. My husband and I have been doing youth ministry, and now he is the senior pastor of our church. We live in Seattle. We've got four incredible teenagers. Um, I'm very passionate about like parenting and marriage and all of that. Um, but I, I'm, I'm super agreeable, very, very nice, like to keep my friends, don't like to confront unless, unless you tread on the rights of children, unless an adult starts asking a child to sacrifice their rights and well-being so adults can live as they please. And that is where you go a little too far. And um, anyway, so that happened for me. I think that that a lot of us have sort of a red pill moment where we look at a crazy culture and go, okay, now, now we fight, right? Like a lot of us for a long time just went along with what culture was doing. Um, but many of us over the last 10 years or so have had something that has forced us to, like it's awakened a bit of a political animal in many of us mm -hmm. where we said, and now I have to be engaged. So for me, that moment was the gay marriage debate. That was the first time that I really heard the culture saying, um, you know, really demonizing, not just you're wrong, but like you're evil, you're bigoted, you're hateful, you're phobic. If you don't agree with this never before in our species radical proposal that two men or two women can be married. Um, and the thing that two things pushed me over the line. Number one um, was this idea that you hated gays if you believed in traditional marriage. And that's garbage because everybody I know who supports traditional marriage also loves their gay family and friends. Uh, that's certainly the case for me. My mom has been in a relationship with her female partner for 35 years. And They've been a part of my childhood, my adolescence, you know, my adulthood, my children's lives. Um, I, my mom is like my top. I mean, she's, we're just very, very, very close. And this idea that um, animus and phobia and hatred, you know, contributes to this idea that children to have a mother and father is just insane. The other big thing that pushed me over the line was this idea that was used to push gay marriage in that kids don't care if they have two moms or two dads. But functionally, what that means is kids don't care if they've lost their mom or dad. And mm -hmm. I've done enough work with kids, whether it's in youth ministry, high school ministry, college ministry, um, middle school work, adoption work, to know that one of the most painful things in a child's life is if they've lost their mom or dad, even if the adults in their life are striving to mend that wound. Um, and so that was what got me from the place of being more of a grace giver to a truth teller, where I mm -hmm. said, if you're going to weaponize the pain of children to advance a radical agenda, you're going to have to go through me. So mm -hmm. that's uh, why I started to write and then eventually founded the nonprofit Them Before Us, which looks at every marriage and family issue from the perspective of children's right to their mother and father. So awesome. And I know folks listening are already getting inspired because we see 
already this playing out in so many parts of our society, from our schools Mm -hmm. to our politics. We see children not being considered first and what they really need. It's about what do the adults want? And then we make all these Mm -hmm. rationalizations for how the kids are going to be just fine. So let's start with one of the things you said, which was so interesting, which is, you know, you first got galvanized and you have a mother who's in a same sex relationship. So it's not like this is Mm -hmm. foreign to you. uh, But you first got galvanized around the gay marriage debate, this idea that children don't need a mother and a father. They are fine with two moms or fine with two dads. You know, I remember seeing this a lot growing up, you know, especially at UCLA, friends of mine, and the, the, the debate was pretty hot. This was a little over maybe a decade and a half ago now in California after Prop 8, um, which would have, which did, uh, the, uh, Californians said, we want marriage between a man and a woman. That's what we want for the state. And then uh, political powers tried to override that, um, I think unconstitutionally at the time. So that's a that's a whole other, a whole other thing. But this idea that children are fine, just as fine as anyone else, if they have parents of the same sex, two moms or two dads. First of all, let's just talk about the reality. It's impossible to have two moms biologically, right? Or two dads biologically. So like you said, they actually are missing a biological parent. Tell me more about the research on that, Katie, because there are a lot of advocates for same-sex parenting, quite frankly, not just marriage, but parenting, who say, well, all the studies prove right. that those kids are just the fine or even better, some will, some even say, than kids with their own mom and dad. Yeah. Let's lay the foundation here a little bit because that's very, very helpful. I think that you and I are hopefully going to hit a lot of these different challenging topics, whether it's gay parenting, surrogacy, third-party reproduction, what is the point of adoption, all of these different things. And actually, if you understand the fundamentals of who children are and what they need, most of these questions answer themselves. Mm -hmm. So let's just talk about children's rights to their mother and father. Um, We largely, I think your audience um, and conservatives and Christians generally understand that children have a right to life even if it's not recognized by the civil government, we are arguing upon the natural law perspective that they have a natural right to life. This is something that will not change depending on what country they live in, what time frame they live in, and even what the laws say. These simply, there is a natural fundamental right children have to life. The same metric that we use to determine whether or not children have a right to life can also be applied to children's right to be known and loved by the two people responsible for their existence. And what we see is if that right was protected and defended, we solve nearly every social issue that we are facing today because we look at things like homelessness, child poverty, teen pregnancy, teen suicide, dropout rates, and all of them have something in common. And that is that they are overrepresented by children who have lost a relationship with their mother or father, right? Disproportionately fatherless children are at risk. 90% of homeless youth didn't have a dad. 71% of kids who commit suicide, 71% of kids who drop out of high school, 63% of girls who are teen moms did not have a dad growing up. And so can you imagine the power of defending this child right to their mom and dad? So why? The question is like, why does this fundamental child right have so much social power? And it's for three reasons. Number one, a child's own mother and father are statistically, and I say this with full force of decades of social science research under my belt, statistically, those adults are the most connected to, protective of, and invested in children. Okay, this idea that love makes a family right? Or if the adults are happy, the kids will be happy is a lie, right? Mm -hmm. What it takes to make sure that kids are safe and happy and safe and loved is actually statistically being raised by their own biological mother and father. And we will get to adoption shortly because as an adoptive mom, I also have opinions um, and a perspective on this. But biologically, Those two people are statistically the safest adults in a child's life. But like you said, there's all of these sort of cultural mantras that we use, like the kids will be fine, and if the adults are happy, and love makes a family, and they're going to be fine, and there's no difference, and all of that. Like if that was the case, if love makes a family, and the adults are happy, the kids will be happy, if biology doesn't matter, then a child who is being raised by their mother and her cohabiting boyfriend would be doing great because they've got two parents, they've got a mother and father figure, the adults are happy, right? The adults love each other. But your audience can just 
Do a quick Google search right now. Google the words mother's boyfriend, okay? And I want you to take a look at that. Pause the podcast if you need to. Search through those pages a little while. And then I want you to come back. Because what you saw is tens of thousands of pages of the most horrific disturbing cases of child abuse and filicide, that would be child homicide, that you're ever going to read on the internet. Because the reality is that when it comes to child safety and well-being, biology is one of the greatest predictors of child safety and thriving. And statistically, the most risky person in a child's life is an unrelated man living in their home left to care for the child alone. So the number one thing you have to get understand is that in the parent-child relationship, there are exceptions, there are terrible, exceptional, horrible, abusive biological parents, but overwhelmingly when children suffer abuse in the home, it, it is it is at the hands of an unrelated adult. So defending children's rights to their mother and father grants them the household where they are most likely to be safe and loved. Number two, only those two adults grant children something that they crave, and that is their biological identity. It is very hard for children to answer the question, who am I? If they cannot answer the question, whose am I? Mm. And that is why you see these, um, you know, in all of these like very poor boroughs of New York, you are seeing these like um, trucks that roll into the neighborhood. They're like, who's my daddy trucks? And you can get a quick DNA test to find out who your daddy is right? In all these places where these kids have no idea who their father is, and yet they want to know. They want to know. And we know because since 1960, when the majority of adoptions were closed adoptions, we now have 95% of adoptions in the United States as open adoptions. Because even if children can't be raised by their first family, they benefit from as much information and connection with their first family as possible. And now we've got Waves and waves of children created through a third party, someone else's sperm or someone else's egg, who are scouring the internet and using 23andMe DNA tests to find who their biological parent is, who many of them have been told, well, that's that's nobody. He doesn't matter to you. But those those children can only get something from that man or that woman that they cannot mm -hmm. get from the man or woman raising them. And that is the answer to who am I? So we can stabilize the identity of an awful lot of children if they are raised and known and loved by both parents. And finally, the incredible thing about defending children's right to the two people that are responsible for their being is you will get the perfect gender balance in the home 100% of the time. And men and women are different. And those differences play out, I would say, the most dramatically in the theater of the home. And they do so in complementary ways. You know, dads emphasize and develop kids' gross motor skills. Moms emphasize and develop kids' fine motor skills. Dads talk to kids with big words like they talk to their buddies and their coworkers. And moms simplify their language right down to where the child is. And it's wild just... that you're, you're not allowed to say this today. I mean, what you're just saying, you know, men and women are different. This is like the, the big faux pas today to dare to say there is a difference. And at the same time, we all know there is a difference and the data shows that there's a difference. But what you're describing is, is the beauty of that difference. You know, it's not a bad difference. These are good differences and they're benefit for children. Yeah, they are. And it's undeniable. It's self-evident. It's irrefutable. Um, and if you're looking at well-cold data, it is absolutely ironclad when you're talking about statistical proof. Now, you brought up the good question of, well, what about same-sex parents, right? And there was a rush of studies, especially leading up to Obergefell in 2015, the case that legalized gay marriage across the country, claiming that children raised by two moms or two dads fared no different, right? They're mm -hmm. just fine. But that actually is like one of the greatest sociological miracles ever. Because when you look at children who were raised, who were abandoned, you know, and subsequently adopted by a mother and father, or who experienced a divorce, and then were subsequently raised in a step family situation with a mother and father, or whose parent died, and then the their mother or father remarried, or who were created through sperm or egg donation and then raised by a heterosexual couple, right? In all of those four ways that children experience parental loss, but then were raised by a heterosexual couple, none of those kids fared as well 
as the children who are raised by their own biological mother and father, even though they had both maternal and paternal love. So it's fascinating that when you suddenly study gay parenting, where the only way a child can arrive in that household is through death, divorce, abandonment, and subsequent adoption, or third-party reproduction, that magically those kids are faring just as well, even though they're always starved of maternal or paternal love. Like, there's something fishy going on there. And what's fishy is research bias. You know, when you drill down into the research methodologies of those no different studies, you see it's garbage. It's absolute garbage. It is just political bias wrapped up in research. So, um, yeah, the kids, the explain kids are not that, all right. Expl- explain that a little more. I, I've heard yeah. this before, that these studies are highly biased, unreliable, mm-hmm. inconsistent, that they're not well done, uh, but they're still touted you know, yep. by advocates of same-sex adoption that like, hey, you know, w- what's what's the big deal? You're just you're just a homophobe. You know, you're biased against us. That's why you're saying this. Can you share a little more about how these studies are flawed? It's such an important issue because this lie has gone out so far and so fast that we spend the first half, we spend an entire chapter in our book. Um, we have chapter six is all about same-sex parenting. The first half is devoted to analyzing the data. Why are these, why are these studies so wrong? Why did they get it so backwards? And the answer is you've got some sort of like gold standards when it comes to social science research, right? There is some subjectivity involved, but generally if you want to um, come out with results that can be extrapolated to the wider population, you're going to want a few things. Number one, you're going to want the participants to be chosen at random right? It doesn't really do a whole lot if you say, I want to evaluate how good evangelical couples are at raising kids. And then you go directly to a Baptist church and say, hey, you guys, we're doing a study on whether or not Baptists raise great kids. Who would like to volunteer for this study, Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? No, you want to capture not just those um, results by people that volunteer. And then Mm -hmm. let's just take this Baptist example, right? What the researchers did is they went to the church. They said, the purpose of this study is that if we get these certain results, Baptists are going to get specific tax breaks. And we want you to tell us how you think your children are doing. We're not going to measure their grades, (laughs) their health, their Mm -hmm. incidence of ADHD or whether or not they're medicated. We are just going to say, how do you think your kids are doing? Are they healthy? Are they happy? Are they academically excelling? Um, And then we're not going to have any adequate control groups. We're not going to like pair you up and evaluate you against the Methodists down the street, right? We're just going to like take you as an isolated, you know, and then we're going to study you over a very short period of time. Just we'll have like one or two weeks of, you know, observation and then we're done. A good study would... A good study would look at, find the children of the Baptists at random, would not let those kids know what the purpose of the study was for, evaluate their actual rates of depression or suicide or dropouts or whatever like risk factors they're evaluating. Um, they would compare them to not just Methodists, but a variety of other um, denomination you know, kids, they would study the same group over a long period of time. Um, it wouldn't just be what the adults say, right? And in essence, that is generally the methodology that these same sex, no different studies um, use to come up with this conclusion that these kids who have always lost a biological parent always have the disadvantage of living with an unrelated adult who always suffered the traumatic loss of one parent who are always starved of the developmental benefits of either a male parent or a female parent somehow fare no different. I mean, once you start thinking about it, it is very obvious, um, but it was politically convenient. Mm. I, I think that's such an important point that political convenience and the power of, quite frankly, an activist group mm-hmm. uh, was w- w- basically said your common sense, you know, your everyday experience uh, doesn't matter here. And it and it doesn't it doesn't really it's not relevant at the topic at hand. And if you dare to have the common sense to say, yes, children deserve mothers and children deserve fa- a mother and a father, then you're somehow bigoted. And so the problem is your, your everyday common sense of being like, yeah, kids need a mom and a dad is suddenly quieted dramatically because of accusations, you know, passionate, uh, yeah. full throated accusations of saying, well, if you dare to say the obvious 
You know, if you mm-hmm. dare to state the obvious, then you are a homophobe. You're a transphobe. You're a you're a phobe. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is so it's so tragic because everyday people are kind of silenced by that, Katie. I'm sure you've run into this. This is why your work is so important. And they're like, OK, oh. well, I don't want to really say anything because I don't want to look like a bad guy, you know, mm-hmm. And I'm busy yeah. living my life, so I'm not going to kind of stick my neck out for these other kids out there because I'm sure they're going to be fine, you know, so how big of a deal is this? And so we've gotten it to the point where in the state of California, there is legislation yeah. now that is probably going to go to the governor and he'll sign it because Gavin Newsom is completely insane, I, I think. Um, and it's it's saying that if you're a, a, a man, a, same sex, a gay man, and you're in a you know gay marriage, then the state of California is going to pay for you to rent the body of a woman because you deserve children, that you're right. going to be considered technically infertile because you're uh, not able to naturally bring children to the world. That's the insanity to where we've gotten. Now, uh, you're, if you're a gay man, you're owed a child, right. a motherless child. That's by right. default. So um, first of all, let me say on the whole anti-gay accusation, I understand why it's paralyzing because it paralyzed me for a long time. Mm-hmm. I, I th- The thought of being anti-gay was the worse than being called a racist for me <laughs> because like <laughs> I love, I mean, I'm uh, the, the people I love the most in life, uh, you know, are uh, identify or are in that world. And so the perception of being anti-gay paralyzed me and kept me quiet for way too long. But what is the result of not speaking up? The result is now California is forcing insurance companies to subsidize the creation of motherless and fatherless children for anyone and everybody. That is it. And let me tell you, this is child trafficking. What is going on in the world of big fertility right now is the buying and selling, and not just buying and selling of people, the buying and selling, designing and discarding of people, right? We are at the place. We are. Re- we have returned to the situation that we fought a civil war to end, but this time we're bringing it back in the name of progress and tolerance. And um, it is the result of gay marriage. Like I just published um, at the Federalist yesterday on the connection between this radical bill that's happening in um, California to say, to redefine what it means to be infertile, right? It's no longer unprotected heterosexual sex for 12 months that doesn't result in a pregnancy or live birth. And it is now anybody that has a sort of social infertility, they can't get pregnant on their own or with their partner. So a single person can be infertile, two men are infertile, two women are infertile, even though their bodies are perfectly capable of creating a child, their relationship status determines that they're infertile. And anybody that is captured under this new definition of infertility, who then uses these mandated, the the state will mandate uh, insurance to cover their IVF costs, Every child brought into the world under that new definition will be motherless or fatherless. So our, I will say, our collective cowardice on the topic of gay marriage, because there were too few people who were willing to speak up for what was at stake, has led to this new marketplace of babies that are going to be put into households where they are much at much higher risk of abuse, neglect, um, and certainly maternal or paternal deprivation because we failed to stand up on their behalf and speak for them. It's so terrifying, but it's so important that we know and that we now, for anyone listening, we're now no longer silent. The principle that no adult deserves a child, that we're not entitled to a child. You know, children Mm -hmm. are gifts. Children are blessings, you know, if you're seeing from a spiritual perspective, but you're not entitled to another human being. You're just right. not entitled to them. You, you're not, you're not, you don't own them. They're not your belongings. They're not your prop. Mm-hmm. They're not your property. And so mm-hmm. I think that's part of the the problem here is we're so uh, adult centric. And I know you talk about this a lot that we forgot that we don't, we're not the owners and we're not mm-hmm. entitled. And so if you're blessed with a child, then you should, you, you, that's wonderful. And that should be pursued in a marriage where there's that child's going to have a mother and a father and that, that's that psychological stability of having that family structure. Yeah. But otherwise, you know, the fact that we're now even paying for uh, singles to go and create children um, and, and same sex couples to go and create children. And in the process of the creation, it's very fraught for the child. Walk us through some of that. We've, we've addressed IVF um, on the show a little bit before. We're going to deep dive it more in the future. But talk about how 
IVF and the surrogacy process, the harm to children of these processes, which are used by both straight and same sex That's couples. Right. Yep, that's exactly right. Um, we have an article that we wrote a while back called Yes, Surrogacy is Wrong When Straight Couples Do It, right? Like in the world of children's rights. So what is the rule for children's rights? There is one rule, regardless of whether you're talking about the definition of marriage or when a divorce is necessary or same-sex parenting or transgender parenting or cohabitation or polygamy or third-party reproduction or adoption. What is the rule? The rule is adults do hard things for kids. Adults don't make kids sacrifice for them. If you are sacrificing on behalf of a child, you get the them before a seal of approval. If you are forcing a child to sacrifice for you, you are violating the rights of the child. And that is where every adult should stand in the way, right? Mm -hmm. So what is, what is really going on? What are the child sacrificing aspects of this bill that just passed, for example, in California, because it is it is sort of an archetype, right, of what it means to have a right to parenthood or a right to a child, even if you are single or in a non-procreative relationship. Okay, let's talk about that. So first of all, IVF. Okay, now this is very, very hard for a lot of people in the conservative Christian pro-life world. Why? Because we love babies. And so many of us have dedicated, as you know, as you've modeled, we've dedicated so much of our lives to defending the existence of babies. And so often in our mind, we think IVF is about babies. IVF is about allowing an infertile couple who would be an incredible mother and father to have the baby that they long for. IVF is not about babies. When you actually look at what takes place in the laboratories, in the clinics, IVF is not about babies. IVF is about on-demand designer babies shipped worldwide. That is what IVF is. And when you look at the, um, when we do get a chance to glance under the covers of what's happening in big fertility, we find that only about 7% of lab created babies are born alive. This Whoa. process, Let, right. What, let's stop for a second. Okay. Anybody listening who's pro-life should be chilled by that statistic that you just shared, Katie. And if you're not pro-life yet, you should, mm -hmm. and you just have a concern for humanity in general, and you're listening, you're saying only 7% of children mm -hmm. created in IVF labs make it alive to birth. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So by the numbers, the baby making industry destroys more embryonic life than the baby taking industry. Right. The last time we've so, got numbers so for this. You're more likely to die in an IVF clinic by percentage than if you're conceived in the in the body of your parent, meaning the no. abortion rate doesn't even. Well, meaning 90 percent plus of children created in IVF right. clinics are right. end up uh, are killed ultimately or end up perpetually frozen and never have a chance to right. be born. You're more likely to have your life snuffed out by the people claiming to bring new life into the world than you are at Planned Parenthood. That's what I'm saying. So it's incredibly convicting. And I, I'm sure right. people listening, you know, and again, this is not anyone listening who's like, maybe they know someone who had a baby that was conceived through IVF and is among us today. And, you know, this is not to say that child's life isn't incredibly valuable and just as valuable as any other child. But what we're talking about is the industry mm -hmm. and the the, the the approach that we have today that IVF is an option and is, is given as an option and the, is, the lethality that it has yeah. for children. It is because the baby that you're holding created through IVF is so precious that mm. it's horrifying what IVF, what the big fertility world is doing to the other 93% of children who were deemed the wrong sex and discarded who didn't make the grade and were discarded, who were donated to research because they, they were a surplus child, because they're still in the deep freeze six years later or 16 years later or 26 years later because the parents didn't have the money or the means or the desire to go back and get them. Um, it is because when they implanted two, they twinned and then they needed to selectively reduce two of those children, which is abort between 12 and 20 weeks, which is standard language in surrogacy contracts, by the way. Um, it is because they did not survive the freeze or didn't survive the thaw after the freeze or the transfer or whatever it is. Like there is such a gauntlet of risks and eugenic selection that takes place in the IVF world that this is 
this cannot be construed as child friendly or child honoring really in any way. And I have talked with pro lifers who have used IVF, um, and the ones that did so without violating the rights of the child had to fight their doctors and the clinic at every step of the way. Um, so if you do go into pro-life convictions intact, you will be doing it alone. Well, the other the other challenge with that, too, is in addition to the child having a right to a mother and a father and ideally the biological mother and a father. And we'll, I want to talk about adoption in a minute. You know, I do think a child also has a right to be conceived in love naturally. And so that's the other, even if IVF was somehow perfected, which it, I don't think it can be for many reasons, and it certainly isn't in some way so that there's no risk to that child being conceived or the risk is less than the child being conceived naturally somehow. But, you know, it's funny how when you break nature, you end up breaking more than, you know, you end up breaking other things. And you, but, if the child, the child also deserves to be conceived in a lo the loving embrace of the parents and not yeah. in a, not in a medical facility. And even, so I like how you couch this, like there are some non-negotiables from the children's rights perspective. You know, we argue, okay, full disclosure, I am an absolute Bible nut. I carry my Bible around with me everywhere. Like uh, scripture is my ultimate authority. Um, but all of what we do at Them Before Us is based on natural law, social science. So I completely agree with you, especially from a spiritual perspective. Mm -hmm. There's a spiritual aspect, spiritual element. But what I try to do and model for the people that follow us is you can make these arguments without scripture, without appealing to of um, special revelation, right? Which I know you do a lot in your work as well. Well, and I'm, so, I'm saying well, the same thing. I mean, I don't think oh, you need to I, be a Christian or a Catholic to say that it's best for children to be conceived naturally. So, and what I'm about to say is all of the research validates that too. And we have an entire post on our website called IVF Harms to Children that catalogs, you know, where you'll find links to that 7% figure. But you're also going to find a lot of the research that we have on children who were created in glass, in vitro, and how it harms their cognitive development, their physical development, their increased risk of developing different cancers. When, like you said, when we take this out of the natural world and we try to put this into our own hands, even the children that do survive, even the children that aren't cut off from their mother or father, even they are at increased risk of some pretty significant harms throughout their life. And so we have to, um, for those of us that genuinely care about the rights and well-being of children, this industry, IVF, even when the even when it's ourselves or our sister or our best friend who want to employ these technologies, we must prioritize the rights of the children first because they are the most vulnerable in this equation and they should have our allegiance first. Let's talk about surrogacy next, because this is in order for surrogacy to happen, you need IVF. So you have that. But there's additional harm with surrogacy. Walk us through the the, the harm of surrogacy for the child. Good. Um, the easiest way to break this down for people, because, again, there is so much moral confusion among Christians, conservatives and people that are on the right, even pro-lifers about this, again, because we love babies. Um <laughs> But the easiest way to explain what surrogacy does is surrogacy splices what should be one woman, a mother, into three purchasable and optional women, okay? So the first mother is the genetic mother. This is the egg donor. And I say donor because nobody's donating. Everybody's buying and selling. This is a marketplace. But this one is the one that the child's going to get their genetic identity from, right? So all of those different kids that I talked about early on, the adoptees, the ones that are, you know, looking for the who's my daddy truck, um, the children conceived through sperm and egg donation, all of them are at disproportionate risk of what sociologists call genealogical bewilderment, which is the idea mm -hmm. of like, you look in the mirror and you don't know who you are. You're like, where did I get that nose? Why do I look that way? I don't look like anybody else in my family. And it's incredibly, de it can be destabilizing for children who grow up apart from their mother or father, especially if it's not an adoption and the adults in their life are the ones that chose for their biological parent to be missing. That adds a, a increased psychological burden. 
So this one tells the child who they are biologically. Can you, let's just stop that. I think that's a very important point. Sorry, I wanted you to finish this, but what you said is so important. You said it's especially destabilizing when it's the adults in the child's mm-hmm. life who ha- who were they were the ones who chose to break the biological bond because it's one thing if yeah. your biological parent dies your biological parent because mm-hmm. of neglect or abuse or addiction can't care care for you and then another couple steps in sacrificially and loves you like their own but it, if that couple that steps in to love you like their own is the one who bought and purchased the biological parent and and manufactured yeah. this deal so to speak it's different is what you're saying We spend quite a bit of time in chapter nine on our book, contrasting adoption and reproductive technologies, right? Because both of them are oftentimes people will look at sperm donation, egg donation, surrogacy and say, well, it's just like adoption. And they're right that both of them begin with child loss. They are right. Mm -hmm. But that is where that is where the similarities end. Right. Because what you see in the world of third party reproduction, whether it's sperm donation, egg donation or womb rental is these adults that are employing those technologies are inflicting the wound on children. Mm-hmm. In adoption, these adults are seeking to mend the wound that children have experienced. And we only have one study that compares outcomes for children created through sperm donation and children who were adopted. And it's fascinating because the children created through sperm donation are being raised by a biological parent, their mother. And the adoptees are being raised by neither biological parent, but the adoptees fare better. Why is that? I know, I know. And it's because, in my opinion, the only explanation is these kids cannot process or talk about their wound. They have to suffer and bear it alone because if they were to say to their mother, who is my father? Does he know who I am? I would love to meet him someday. He is talking to the woman responsible for that man never having contact with him ever again Wow! versus adoptive parents who are pretty familiar with those conversations with their kids who say, you know, why did my mother leave me at the orphanage door? Or, you mm. know, why, why is it that I'm not being raised by the woman that I, I get to exchange letters with? Um, mm. And the answer mm. from the adoptive parents is, isn't that hard? That's mm. so hard. I'm so sorry. There's a real Mm. wound there and we'll walk through it together. Now, can you see Mm. the impact, right? That that has on the child to be in the relationship with the person who is seeking to mend what they've lost versus the person who insisted that their desires were more important than what the child's rights were and insisted that the child shoulder that loss so they could live as they please. So yes, there is a very big difference. And we spend quite a bit of time talking about that um, in our book and in our work. Wow. So you were, you were sharing more about surrogacy, though, and walking us through, and I took you on the tangent about that, that distinction between adoption, you know, egg donor versus adopted parent. Mm-hmm. But t- tell me more about sur- surrogacy, back yeah. to surrogacy. The Critical interruption. It's, it's a critical interruption. It's something that we, mm-hmm. I, I'm not kidding, right? Like a lot mm-hmm. of us mm-hmm. who are more conservative and Christian get very hung up on this because adoption is an institution centered around the well-being of kids and it has a critical social purpose. Reproductive technologies are a marketplace centered around the desires of adult and must be opposed for everybody that are using it, 100%. So egg donor is the genetic mother that tells the child who they are. The surrogate is the birth mother, right? This is the woman, This is the only person the child knows for the first nine and a half months of their life, right? There is already a maternal bond that is being developed between mother and child before the baby even makes it onto this side of the womb. And for all of you, any of you who have volunteered at like pregnancy resource centers and things like that, you don't tell those women you're going to be a mom. You tell her you are a mom. You're a mom now, right? The baby already knows you. The baby already loves you. The baby already knows the sound of your voice and your smell and your heartbeat. Mm. We don't put babies on the chests of random strangers so they can form a bond after they're born. We put babies on their mother's chest because they have an existing bond. And it's that woman, it's her voice, it's her smell, it's her nearness that drops babies' cortisol levels because it's the only thing in the world that they know. So when you intentionally Mm. sever that bond, what you're saying is you're setting the child back in terms of trust and attachment nine and a half months. 
And we already know through researching and studying adoptees that this is what many of them would call a primal wound, something that the loss of their birth mother Mm. is something that hindered their ability to trust and attach throughout life. Um, And again, that's not an indictment on adoptive parents or adoptees. It is a recognition of how important this primary relationship is in the lives of children. So that's it. Like the birth mother is the only relationship the child has, and it is sets the foundation for relationship building throughout the rest of life. And then the third mother is what um, donor conceived people call the social mother. And that is the woman who provides the daily love and nurture and female presence, right? The one who um, mm-hmm. simplifies simplifies her language so the child can understand exactly what she's saying, right? The one that is going to model womanhood in the home, the one who um, tends to be a little more focused on caregiving versus like like a rambunctious play. And children who don't have that mm. female figure in their home, um, they will crave it, right? We call this mother hunger. Mm. Um, and we see it in children who don't have a dad. They experience father hunger. They start to gravitate to whatever man is in their life, their coaches, their teachers. And sometimes that goes poorly because they're more susceptible to predatory male attention. So mm. from a child's perspective, all three of these women are critical. The genetic mother, the birth mother, and the social mother. And if these women are not found in the same person, the child is going to experience loss And what surrogacy says is, we can break these up. Tell me which one you don't have. Tell me which one you need to rent or purchase. Cut the check. We can get it done for you. And it's no wonder that there's so much confusion, I think, and and suffering for kids today. And when when the whole the mindset is for adults. And what does the adult want? There was a, uh, an exchange recently in the, by the Kardashians on the reality TV show about yes. Chloe re- regretting. It sounded like being regretful about using surrogacy because she felt the sense of shame when she took that baby, who all that baby knew was the surrogate mom, that, that let little baby was nestled in for nine months. And then as, upon birth, hand it off to Chloe and she puts the baby on her chest and the baby doesn't know her. It's a brand new person. Right. And, you know, she's having a conversation with her sister, Kim, and Kim says, well, yeah, I did it too, but I was fine. But yeah, the baby doesn't know your heartbeat. It's a lot more than a heartbeat. It's a lot more than a heartbeat. Right. Do you think that there's a change happening, Katie, in, in no small part because of your work and the brave voices of people who are exposing the harm of surrogacy and IVF? Do you feel like there's a change happening well, the in good mindset news about is that- it? Yeah. What I've noticed is in our work, once you hear it, you won't unhear it. Once you see that children have a right to their mother and father, that only these people do certain things for the child that nobody else can do, you start to see it everywhere. And that's probably the biggest feedback that we get is once you have this information, you cannot shake it. And so, you know, you see things like what Chloe um, really, I mean, she did a great job of being pretty honest about how she was feeling. And people can look at that and they can empathize with where she's at. You know, they can say, well, that's true. Because when I had my baby, I immediately felt a bond. What's harder to do is empathize with the baby, right? So think Mm. about it this way. Chloe had a hard time connecting with this child. Um, She had dozens or hundreds of other relationships and she struggled. The baby had one relationship one relationship wow. with the birth mother. Do you think the baby Such a good struggled? Point. You know, and the answer is, hell yes, the baby struggled. Yes, yes, yes. And mm. we can empathize and look at it from the adult's perspective. What we need to start doing is shifting and looking at things from the child's perspective. And so that is what we seek to do at them before us is we say, whatever's going on with the adults, challenging marriage, infertility, same-sex attraction, unwanted singleness, unexpected pregnancy, whatever is going on with you, we want to empathize, we want to understand, we want to bear your burden, but whatever you're feeling never justifies violating the rights of children. And that sort of uniform, seamless garment of child defense does uh, seem to make a difference. So I don't know if we're at a tipping point Because to me, this information still um, is not getting out broadly, but uh, that is definitely something that we are seeking to change. 
I think it's starting. I think it turns slowly, especially when there's so much blindness and apathy. But I think the work that you're doing and increasingly the stories that are emerging, because it's also a lot of this technology is new. So you're having a whole generation of kids who never knew their parents, not because of accident again or because of addiction or things like that, but because of the choice, the choice to use surrogacy, the choice to use IVF. So it's all experimental. And we're going to hear the voices more of these children. And I know that's part of your work, too, is sharing their stories. But some of them are so young, they don't have really that voice to speak out yet. But as they get older, sharing about, hey, wait a minute, was my interest put first here? And, And it wasn't. And can we change that for future children? There's so much that the pro-marriage, pro-family world can learn from the pro-life movement. Um, And I really feel like that's the pattern that we need to follow is unflinching child defense. But Mm -hmm. our, um, our battle does have one advantage, and that is that our victims are alive and can tell their Mm -hmm. stories, right? And that is one big thing that we have is we do have the stories of kids who are raised by two moms or two dads, um, or the children who were conceived through, um, you know, at the hand of a technician rather than in the loving embrace of their mother or father, and they can tell their stories. Um, So that is a big aspect of what we're doing. And, you know, if you are listening and you have that story of um, two moms or two dads, um, someone that was conceived using a third party, um, you know, somebody who was had a single mother by choice or parents cohabited. And then you were one of the very high rates of kids who watched their them break up, even though they told you that marriage was just a piece of paper and it didn't matter. You can send me your story and I will do what I can to change the world with it because it mm-hmm. is the stories of kids that has the power to change hearts and minds. So powerful. Before we close out here and we've got to do this again, Katie, this is so good. Tell me, Uh, Tell us again, and we've mentioned it multiple times already, but just to close the loop on it for folks who may be listening who are still like, wait a minute, what about adoption? Because Mm -hmm. adoptive kids do have some struggles. I mean, I think that is an issue, Mm -hmm. even in the pro-life world, when we celebrate adoption without acknowledging the toughness of it, because it is tough for kids. It can be, you know, every kid's different. It's varying degrees, but um, there are wounds there. There can certainly be wounds there. And so can you explain for us again, uh, or, or share with us how the how this is different and how the children's rights application works in the context of adoption. Good. We talk in chapter nine, we just, we talk about four different ways that adoption supports children's rights while reproductive technologies violate children's rights. So I'll give you a couple of them. Hmm. Number one, you know, when I worked at the adoption agency, um, we were there to give parents to every child that did not have one. Okay. So the adults paid us and the adults applied, but they were not our client. The child was the client. If we were successful, every child that needed a home would find loving parents, but not every adult that wanted a kid would get one. Mm. Okay. That is what good adoption looks like. In the world of big fertility, it's exactly the opposite. It, the, the, mm. the adult is the client. The goal is to get them a baby, no matter the cost, no matter the cost mm. of the child that they're taking home or the dozens of kids that don't make it through the process, right? Mm. The goal is to make sure the adults are happy, not that the child has a biological relationship with both parents or even that their right to life is protected. The Mm. goal is to give the adults what they want. And one of the main ways that that um, takes on some very high risk is in adoption, adults do the hard things. So when my husband and I adopted our son, we spent months like every other adoptive parent, doing screenings, vettings, background checks, home studies, you know, references, physical exams, financial reports. I mean, all of that um, because social workers recognize that biology matters and you can't just hand over a a kid to an adult that says, I'm going to love them. No, Mm. you need to be scrutinized. And so in adoption, adults do hard things for kids. Mm. But in the world of reproductive technologies, there's no screening. There's no background check. The only check that has to clear is the check at the bank. And so you have singles or doubles, men or women who are walking out of the hospital with a totally unrelated child where nobody's vetted them. We don't know where they're going. They're not being tracked. There's no post-placement reports being done on these kids. And Mm. in chapter nine of our book, we talk about some of the... Yeah, it's terrifying. It is child trafficking. That is what it is. Have you heard of the case of uh, Shane Dawson, the YouTuber? This is just one example of what you're describing, but there's a famous YouTuber. Very, 
very famous YouTuber. I mean, he has years of, of uh, sexually abusing children. Even he documents himself doing it on his channel. Yeah. And he uh, jokes about it, jokes about pedophilia, committing bestial, bestiality acts with his cat. I mean, just really heinous stuff. And he's now talking about, oh, I'm a different person now and I'm going to go you know, go through IVF, go through sur surrogacy, and I'm going to have a baby. Yep. And it's like, who is monitoring right. this? This man is going to buy a baby. And what's going to happen right. to this baby? Yeah. Not just buy a baby, but design a baby. Mm. Yeah. He's he's designing a baby. And well, they talk we about how have... there's a dozen embryos and they're going to have to pick some. I mean, he and this male partner, they're talking about, we're going to have to pick out of these dozen babies right. or 10 babies. So what's going to happen to the other ones? They're going to get killed. I mean, it's, they're gonna it's get killed, and, and people gonna get are frozen. watching this for entertainment. It's, yeah, it's, that's right. it's devastating. Yeah. So, um, we, we already have cases, right. Where people who would never, ever have passed an adoption screening, acquire a surrogate born child because there's just no safeguards. So that's a, it is, it is a child commodification. Um, and while there can be problems in adoption, all of the best practices are established to um, to re to try to reject in as whatever you can possible adults that would threaten kids, and none of that mm -hmm. exists in big fertility. I think it's no surprise that we're facing all of this, Katie, when we permitted abortion in the first place. I mean, the ultimate yes. right of a child, the first right, is life. And we're not talking about possible children, potential children. These are children who are already with us. They're, they're, they're embryos, they're fetuses, they're, they're pre-born human beings, and they're being destroyed through abortion 2,500 times every single day in America is the abortion rate. So is it any surprise that we have zero respect for their dignity, their rights, when it comes to this other world of now parents want the child, so they're going to go through any, any length to get that child that they feel that they deserve and they need? Um, where can people follow your work, Katie? It's so important, and I'm so grateful for the pioneering work that you're doing. Um, thank you. You're exactly right. Let me just say that mm -hmm. we often talk about how abortion and reproductive technologies are two sides of the same child commodifying coin, right? That in abortion, if the child is unwanted, you can force them out of existence and deny them their right to life. In reproductive technologies, if a child is very wanted, you can force them into existence and deny them their right to their mother and father or their siblings their right to life. Both of these are really just the commodification of children expressed in two different ways. And especially the pro-life world needs to start kind of fighting on both fronts. Uh, in terms of our work, we're at thembeforeus.com. The book, Them Before Us, Why We Need a Global Children's Rights Movement, will make you an expert. You will know <laughs> more about how to defend children in every one of these theaters of marriage mm -hmm. and family than anyone else. You will know all of the studies, and more importantly, you will see the faces of children who have lived through these versions of modern families, and it will fill you with fire and courage to defend them. Um, and uh, I'm also on Twitter too much, so you can find me there. <laughs> Advocati, right? Or Advocati? Uh, yeah, what is your Advocati. handle on Twitter? Check yeah, check it out. It. She's a great follow. Um, Katie, thank you so much. We will be following your work and supporting it and looking forward to having you on again. But thank you for your work. Press on and we're with you. Thanks for having me. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast with Katie Faust. Isn't she amazing? Definitely go check out her work. This is, like she said, the other flip, the other side of the coin for the pro-life fight is what, how do we care for these children uh, and, and what are their outcomes after birth and what's happening in the big fertility industry. So very, very important topic. I would love to hear your thoughts. Please um, leave your comments on YouTube. I read all of them, um, Instagram, Twitter, send me your messages. I love getting them. You can also email the show at Lila at gtbmedia.com. That's Lila at g tbmedia.com. Love your support. Thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Uh, don't forget to leave us a rating on Apple. That really helps boost the podcast and helps it reach more people. Don't forget about our YouTube channel. Subscribe there. We're putting out lots of great content there. And for those listening who may feel so led, we have a Patreon. We're just getting this started. Um, we're going to have some special behind the scenes access for folks in the future. Please check out our Patreon. The link is here. We've gotten our first uh, subscribers there, and I'm so grateful for you guys. This is how our podcast is going to help grow. So check that out and become a member. And we will talk to you guys next week. Thanks so much.